My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power, to make known to the children of man your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his works. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves them. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord. So good to see you today. Uh, I'd remind you that uh, there are so many things that are going on in our ministry during the week, and it's easy for us at times to think that the only thing that happens is here on Sundays. At times, as pastors, we, we get teased saying that we only work one day a week, and um, we actually work a couple of more days than Sunday, but uh, there are a lot of things that are taking place, and so I, I wanna encourage you to always be in prayer for what God is doing in our ministry. Uh, be praying for our school this week. Dr. Mike Hill is doing a fantastic job leading our school, and we appreciate him so very much. And starting tomorrow morning, we're going through our accreditation process. Our school is fully accredited, and that is a, a very detailed process. We'll have people on our campus that will be leading through that accreditation process. And we're ready. Are we ready, Dr. Hill? We're ready, right? We're ready, all right? He's ready, he's been doing a lot of work and our staff has been faithful and so we appreciate them so very much. So you be in prayer for that and be reminded that, that each and every day on this campus we have some 220 kids plus moms and dads that are walking in and out of here and uh, uh, we believe in a kingdom-based education and by that uh, each and every day our boys and girls are taught the word of God and they're taught to be citizens of the kingdom and what that means to be a follower of Jesus Christ, and so uh, we're so uh, thankful for the ministry that we have, and we need your prayers, and obviously our, our food pantry and all that's involved in that. Uh, we've mentioned very little recently, but we have our Thanksgiving dinner that's coming up in just a, a few weeks on Thanksgiving, in which we'll feed, Lord willing, several hundred people, and I'll make an announcement about that at the conclusion of the service, but uh, I'm so grateful for all that God is doing at Hollywood Community Church. God is good. Is he not? As a matter of fact, if you're church people, you know that, that there's a tradition that the pastor makes that phrase and the congregation responds. Let's see whether you know the response. God is good. And all the time. Man, are you good. Look at that. We didn't even practice that. Didn't even practice that. Let's say it again. God is good. And all the time. He most certainly is. God isn't just good whenever we receive tremendous blessings, but even when we're going through struggles and trials, God is always good. That, by the way, is the truth that we see in the verses that we're studying today. And so if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Psalm 145. And once again, I would encourage you to bring a Bible. You can bring a uh, traditional Bible like I have in my hands, or you can have your a U version on your iPhone or your iPad, but we'd encourage you to have your own portion of God's Word that you can follow along. Psalm 145, today I'll read just two verses, verses 8 and 9. Follow along, we'll put it up on the screen. David says, the Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and his mercy is over all that he has made. Aren't those two wonderful verses? As a matter of fact, let's put them back on the screen. Would you read them with me again? Let's read them together, all right? You might have a different version. If you have a different version, read along. I'm reading out of the ESV, Psalm 145, verse 8. Read it with me. The Lord is gracious and merciful, 
slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and his mercy is over all that he has made. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much that you're good. Thank you that you're gracious. Thank you that you're merciful. Thank you that you're compassionate. Thank you that you're slow to get angry. Thank you that you abound. You, you run over with steadfast love. Thank you that you're good. Lord, not just to the people that obey you and follow you, but as David says, you're good to all. You, you are good to everyone that you have made. And so, Lord, today we give thanks to you. Uh, we thank you for your graciousness. We thank you for your goodness. Help us to understand you today. Help us to love you more today. Help us to be grateful today for who you are and what you do in our lives. We love you in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. So let me ask you a question as we begin today. Um, in your opinion, or, or, or let, me, let me say it this way. How do you feel, how do you think that God feels about you right now? In, in this very minute, uh, how do you think that God feels about you in this moment? Is God pleased with you? Is God displeased with you? Is God mad with you? Is he angry with you? Is he overjoyed with you? What does God think of you right now? Uh, quite frankly, if we all responded to that, I would venture to say that your opinion probably depends on what you've done or what you haven't done recently. For example, if you've controlled your tongue, if you've not gotten mad at your spouse, if you haven't looked at pornography recently, if you've been faithful in church, you've been consistent in your Bible reading and prayer, then you probably sit back thinking, yeah, I think God's pretty pleased with me right now. I think God's just ready to pour out his goodness on me because I have demonstrated goodness back to him. On the other hand, Maybe you've let some curse words slip out of your mouth. Maybe, maybe you've blown up at your spouse recently. Maybe you've been inconsistent in worship. You've been inconsistent in Bible reading. And because of that, you may tend to think that God is pretty ticked off with you at this moment. And, and, and God just might be holding back blessings from you because you haven't been as good as you should be. You see, we have a tendency to think that God's goodness toward us is dependent upon the way that we act. If we're good, God is good to us. But on the other hand, if we are bad, then we certainly cannot expect anything good from God. Let me ask you today, though, is that the way God operates? Is, is God temperamental? Does God lose his patience with us quickly? Can God be easily angered? Are his blessings upon our lives dependent upon our ability to please him? Dependent upon our ability to do what we would consider good things. Well, well, in today's passage, David addresses that. Now, before we jump into the passage, let me just say that, that the, the, the two verses that, that we quoted today, that we read today, are a quotation from another Old Testament passage. Here in Psalm 34, David is actually quoting the words of God that God gave to Moses on Mount Sinai in Exodus chapter 34. Now, now let me transport you back. Let's go back to Exodus chapter 34 so we remember what is taking place so we can understand the words of God in the context in which they were given and then we can, we can apply them to ourselves. 
You remember that Moses had ascended Mount Sinai. And while he was up on Mount Sinai, the cloud of God, God had descended upon the mount. And there God communicated with Moses. And while Moses was up on Mount Sinai, he received the Ten Commandments on tablets of stone that were written by the very finger of God. Most of you remember the story. While Moses lingered in the presence of God on the mount, the children of Israel became restless. The children of Israel became impatient. And while Moses is up with God on the mount, on Mount Sinai, the children of Israel began collecting all of their gold and their precious stones, and Aaron makes for them a golden calf that the children of Israel begin to worship. You remember the very words of Aaron. They, uh, they made the golden calf, and Aaron tells the children of Israel, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Now let me just put that in context. I don't believe that the Israelites had fully rejected God. They simply had added an idol to uh, their worship. I love the words of Martin Luther. I quoted it several weeks ago. Uh, Martin Luther says, Idolatry isn't just worshiping something other than God. It is worshiping something alongside of God. It is placing something on the same level as God. That's what the children of Israel did while Moses was up on Mount Sinai. Well, you know the story. Moses comes down from the mountain. While he's coming down, he hears the noise, the tumult of the people. He asks Joshua what is going on, and he realizes that the children of Israel are committing both idolatry and immorality while he was in the presence of God. And so in his anger, he takes those two stone tablets. And you know the story. What does he do with the two stone tablets? He throws the stone tablets down and the stone tablets break. As we come to Exodus chapter 34, Moses once again has climbed the mountain. He, he has pleaded for God's forgiveness for the nation of Israel and once again Moses finds himself there in the mount in the very presence of God. And here's what Exodus 34 says. I'm going to put the words up on the screen so you can see. Exodus 34 says this, So Moses cut two tablets of stone like the first, and he rose early in the morning and went up on Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him. And he took in his hand two tablets of stone. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed. Here are the words that God told Moses. The Lord, the Lord a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands. Now, if you'll remember, those are the exact same words. Those are the verses that David uses here in Psalm 145 in his psalm, of praise. Now, you and I, we know the story in Exodus. We know how those words, how those verses applied to the Israelites. But here's the question for us today. How do those verses apply to us? We know that God was demonstrating to Moses and to the Israelites the fact that he was a compassionate, gracious, forgiving God. And by the way, God forgave the Israelites over and over and over again. He was extremely patient with them. By the way, aren't you glad that God is extremely patient with us as well? Because we at times have a tendency to follow the route of the Israelites and demonstrate the same kind of rebelliousness. What what is the application for us? If you're following along in your notes, the first thing that I wrote down is this. God always responds according to his character. God always responds according to his character. Now, if we're not careful, it's easy for us to, to paint an erroneous picture of God. And, and, and maybe you're here today and maybe you have an unbiblical view of God. You see, many today paint God as a tyrant. Uh, Many people view God as, very honestly, an angry old man who easily loses his patience. 
and is looking for a reason to zap anyone who disobeys what he says. Others have a kinder, uh, gentler, more tolerant view of God. They don't view him as a, as a tyrant from the last century. Many people today, unfortunately, view God on the other extreme. The pendulum switches, and now they view God as being politically correct. And many people in this day and age believe that God, for some reason, tolerates abortion, but he doesn't tolerate child abuse. He, he, he's honored for us to worship him in the sanctuary, but for some reason he doesn't notice that even when we leave the parking lot and we take his name in vain, God is patient and none of those things seem to bother him at all. So the question that I want us to see today is this, how is God really? What is God really like? And David seems to answer that question for us today. And so if you're following along in your notes, the next thing I wrote down is this. These verses give us a beautiful description of God. These two small verses give us a beautiful description of God. As a matter of fact, John Calvin says these, these verses give us clear and satisfactory a description of God as can be found anywhere in Scripture. Now, what's interesting these, these same verses, we already said that they're based out of Exodus chapter 34, verses 6 and 7. These same verses are found five other times throughout Scripture. Uh, I won't take the time to look at all of them. They're found two other times in the Psalms. Psalm 86 in verse 15 and Psalm 103 in verse 8. The, these verses are also found in Nehemiah chapter 9 and verse 17. As Nehemiah is preparing the children of Israel to build the wall, he calls the Israelites to repentance. And as he calls them to repentance, he says this about God. He says, but you, O God, are ready to forgive, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. The next time these verses are found are in Joel chapter 2. And in Joel chapter 2, once again, the prophet Joel is calling the nation of Israel to repentance. Once again, they had strayed away from God. And Joel calls Israel back to God, calls them to repent. And in Joel chapter 2 and verse 13, Joel says, Return to the Lord your God. Why? For he is gracious. He's merciful. He's slow to anger. He's abounding in steadfast love. The last time this verse is found is found in Jonah chapter 4 and verse 2. Most of you are familiar with the story of Jonah. God tells Jonah to go preach to that wicked city, Nineveh. Jonah runs the wrong direction, swallowed by a great big fish. The fish then spits him out on dry land. He's right there at Nineveh. And so Jonah stands up in Nineveh and begins to preach the message that God had given him, saying, repent, because destruction is coming. And what happened? Nineveh repented. From the king down. The people of Nineveh repented, and as a result, God stayed his hand. God did not send the judgment that he had said he would bring. And so, how does Jonah respond? Rather than being joyful because the Ninevites had repented, Jonah was mad at God because God didn't punish the Ninevites. And Jonah makes this statement. In Jonah chapter 4 and verse 2, he says, I knew it, God. I know, I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And so we see God describes himself this way at least six times in Scripture. Now, I want us to kind of dissect those phrases today and then put it in a way that, that you and I can kind of wrap our minds around. Notice that first phrase. It says, the Lord is gracious and merciful. Most of us are familiar with these terms. Mercy means that you do not receive what you deserve. Grace is when you receive what you don't deserve. Let me say it again. Mercy is not receiving what you do deserve. Grace is receiving what you don't deserve. For example, you're caught speeding, 
the police officer pulls you over, asks for your driver's license, registration, insurance card. You show him all of that. You were caught red-handed. You were going 20 miles over the speed limit. And for some strange reason, the police officer hands your license, your registration, your insurance back to you and says, okay, slow down. You breathe a sigh of relief. What is that? That's mercy. That's mercy. He didn't give you what you deserve. But just imagine that same police officer who pulled you over for going 20 miles over the speed limit that just showed mercy to you says, hold on just for a second, and goes back to his car and comes back with a sheet of paper and gives you a citation for being a good driver, a commendation for being a good driver. That's what? That's grace. You're getting what? You're getting what you do not deserve. Guys, you come home from work and it's been a rough day. You're impatient, maybe even just a little bit mean to your spouse. Wives, are your husbands ever that way? Nobody wants to admit to it, all right? Vicky's down front saying, yes, sir, yes, sir, all right? All right, you come home, you're not as kind as you should be. Maybe an unkind word slips out of your mouth, but your wife ignores your remarks, gives you a great big hug, and tells you she loves you. What is that? That's mercy. But then she goes above and beyond. She cooks your favorite meal with your favorite desserts. You're sitting on the couch that night. She gives you a back rub, and she lets you watch football all night long. What is that? That's grace. That's grace. That's getting what you do not deserve. Listen. Here's what David says, church. David says that God always responds with grace and mercy. David says God is gracious and he's merciful. We see that illustrated all throughout Scripture. You see, in the story of Abraham and the sacrificing of his son Isaac, it was mercy that kept that knife from plunging into little Isaac's chest but it was grace that provided a ram for sacrifice. It was mercy that forgave the prodigal son who came home that had wasted his inheritance. It was grace that threw him a party when he returned. It was mercy that heard the cry of the thief on the cross. It was grace that made the statement, today you will be with me in paradise. You see, mercy paid the price for our sins on the cross. Grace substitutes the righteousness of Jesus Christ for our wickedness. Mercy closes the door to hell. Grace opens the door to heaven. God is gracious. God is merciful. I'm reminded of the words of Jeremiah. Jeremiah 3.22, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. You dovetail that with Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8 in which the apostle Paul says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. Aren't you grateful today for the mercy of God, church? Aren't you grateful today for the grace of God? God is graceful, he's gracious, he's merciful. David says a second thing. He is slow to anger, and he's full of steadfast love. Now notice, David doesn't say that God never gets angry. David says that God is what? That he is slow to anger. Here's the idea. Anger is not the primary posture that God has towards us. Wrath, as someone has said, is not God's preferred option. God didn't send Jesus into the world because he was angry with the world. God didn't send Jesus into the world to get even with us. He sent Jesus, why? Because he loved us. David says that God is slow to anger. I'm reminded of the words of Peter in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises. Some count slow, slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, 
but that all should come to repentance. Let me ask you today, I'd venture it's the same with most of us. I'd venture most of us didn't give our lives to Christ. We didn't become followers of Jesus the first time that we heard the gospel. It might not even have been the second time that we heard the gospel or the third time that we heard the gospel. Like many people in scripture, there probably was a time in your life in which you were running away from God. But God in his patience, God in his compassion, he was what? He was slow to get angry. David said he's slow to get angry and he's abounding in steadfast love. Man, we could pull up a chair and park here because that word steadfast love is one of the most important words in the Old Testament. It's the Hebrew word hasad. It's found 247 times in the Old Testament. It speaks of God's faithful, loyal love for his people. It's based on a covenant commitment, a covenant commitment that God makes towards his people to love them and care for them regardless of whether they love him in return. And you cannot read the Old Testament without catching that message because in spite of Israel's repeated rebellion, God remained faithful to them. How many times did Israel stray away from God? Over and over and over again. And yet every single time that Israel realized, recognized the rebelliousness, fell on their face before God and repented of their sins, how did God respond? God responded with forgiveness and, and he, he brought them back as his people. You say, Brian, is that true? Read the book of Judges. In the book of Judges, they do it over and over and over again. They turn from God, and yet God in his steadfast love remains faithful to them. But notice, it not only says that God has steadfast love, but it says he is abounding in steadfast love. Here's what God wants us to understand. The resources of God's love are our, our unlimited. It's like terrible illustration, but it's kind of like the federal government, all right? The federal government, whenever there's a need, what do they do? They print more money to cover it, all right? We need more money, no problem. We'll just print some more money. The problem is now we don't have the gold reserves to back up the amount of money that we're printing. We're just printing it. There's nothing to back it up. God's not that way, though. God certainly is not that way. God's bank has everything he needs. And there is plenty of love in God's bank to cover his steadfast love for each and every one of us. He has infinite resources to love us. So here's what David said. He's gracious, he's merciful, he's slow to anger, he's abounding in steadfast love. And then we come to verse nine and he makes this simple statement. He says, he is good. Verse nine, the Lord is good to all. Let me give you the fancy definition. Theologians tell us that God's goodness is his benevolence to his creation or his kindness exhibited towards all he has made. Think with me today. Everything that God does is good. His creation, his laws, his actions, even what God permits is good. Remember, he created the earth in six days. And at the end of creating each and every day, God looked at what he created and he made this statement. He said what? It's good. It's good. And at the end of creating everything, once again, God made the statement, it is good. Everything that God does, everything that God has created is good. There is nothing but goodness in his being. Since God is good, he always has our best interests at heart. 
That, that must be true. And if you and I are going to be happy, we must believe the fact that God is good. And whatever God allows in our life, it's good. Boy, that's such a great practice to make. Whenever God blesses you with something, to be able to sit back and say, man, that's good. <laughs> you got to raise at work. That's good, all right? You got a good report from the doctor. That's good, all right? Your kids pass their classes. That's what? That's good, right? We thank the Lord for that. But you know what? Even when difficult things come in our life, we don't get a good report from the doctor. As believers, we have to sit back and trust the Lord and say what? That's good. God, God I lost my job. I don't understand it, but it's good because I trust that you've got my back. My kids are running away from you, but God, it's good, not in the sense that we want them to live that way and not in the sense that you want them to, but God, I trust you. Everything that you have for my life is good. You see, that allows us to be happy. That allows us to be joyful, even the most difficult of situations. Because God is good, nothing happens to us that is not for our ultimate good. If you catch anything I say today, grasp a hold of that. Nothing happens in your life that is not for your ultimate good. You say, Brian, what are you talking about? That makes no sense whatsoever. How can this, what's happening to me today, be for my good? Here's the problem. You only see today. God has the opportunity to look in the future and see how the events of today and how the events of tomorrow are shaping you and molding you into who he wants you to become. So God is able to even look at the tragedies of our life and say, it's good. James 1.17 says this, Every good and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of change. Paul says it this way in Romans 8.28, For we know that for those who love God, all things work together, what does he say? Say it with me again, for what? For good. But we know that, that for those who love God, all things work together for good. You see, God, is, as the master chef, is able to take all the ingredients of our life and mix them together and create something that truly honors and glorifies him. It's good. God is good. And all the time, that's what David says in the passage. Listen, God always responds according to his character. Listen, sometimes I step outside of my character. By that I mean there's times that I respond in a way that I shouldn't respond. I would like to think that I'm always loving and kind and forgiving and gracious, but every once in a while, I step outside of character, like what, Vicki? Once every two or three years, right? Something like that. <laughs> step outside character. It's so abnormal, almost puts her into a heart attack. She's not used to it. No, you know that's not true. I'm being facetious, all right? There's times that I don't act the way, <clears throat> the, way the, the way I should, and there's times you don't act the way you should. But God always responds according to his character. Always. He's always gracious. He's always merciful. He's always slow to anger. He's always abounding in steadfast love. He is always good. God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. Let me show you a second thing and let's apply it. These verses demonstrate how God responds to us. I put just a simple triangle on your, on your outline. If you just look at that, just a simple triangle, because I kind of want to invert, invert uh, these characteristics. And so at the top of your triangle, if you could, just write the word good, or write the word God is 
good. You see, the goodness of God is at the top of that triangle. God's goodness represents the infinite abundance of God's love spilling down over each side, over every single aspect of his repentant people as we respond to God. God's goodness trickles down into our lives. In the middle of each side, uh, write the second and third statements. God is slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. You see, when God says that he keeps steadfast love, the focus is on the durability of his love. His love lasts. His love perseveres. His love keeps flowing. And at the bottom of the triangle, right, he is gracious and he's merciful. You see, God's goodness flows into the fact that he's slow to anger and he abounds in steadfast love. And all of that causes him to respond with what? With grace and mercy. You see, if God is slow to anger, even when we give him ample reason to be angry with us because of our sin, then God must be extremely merciful. And God must be extremely forgiving. He forgives iniquity. Thanks, Mark. You are such a great son. (laughs) He forgives iniquity. He forgives iniquity and transgression and sin. You see, the reason that God is slow to anger is not because he doesn't notice our sin, but the reason that he's slow to anger is because he forgives us of our sin when we repent of our sin and we turn to him. And so, here's the very first thing that David says. David says, if you're following along in your notes, David says, God always responds according to his character. Let me show you a second thing quickly. Everyone receives God's goodness. Everyone receives God's goodness. Notice verse nine, not my words, but David's words inspired. The Lord is good to, what's the word that he says next? The Lord is good to all, and his mercy is over all that he has made. Let let me just walk through some things quickly. First of all, we need to realize today that God is good even to those who don't believe in him. Let me say that again, God is good even to those who don't believe in him, to those who reject him, to those who mock him, to those who lift their, lift their fist in the air and curse him, God is good to all. I've given you several ways in your notes, and I'm going to race through them. You say, Brian, how is God good to even those that don't believe in him? Several ways. First of all, by creating man, even though God knew that man would rebel. Why create man if if you knew that he would rebel and sin against your authority? Yeah, that's exactly what God did. God created us knowing what we would do. Quite frankly, there's many mysteries surrounding that that whole thought process, but we may say with certainty that creation in the face of foreknown rebellion is a mark of what? God's goodness. The second thing is by sustaining man in spite of his continued rebellion. Listen, God doesn't execute judgment on people the moment they sin. Aren't you grateful that the very first time you sinned, God didn't say, okay, that's strike one. And the second time, that's two. All right, and the third time you sin, that's it. Go get him. That's it right there. All right? God doesn't respond that way. As a matter of fact, he doesn't respond that way after our third sin. He doesn't respond that way after our three millionth sin. God what? He demonstrates his goodness, even to those who continually rebel against him. Listen, nobody 
would have blamed God for aborting the whole human experiment and starting all over again. I know he did that to a certain degree there with Noah and the flood, and God certainly wouldn't blame him for doing it today. But God continues to show goodness to generation after generation, even when men continually turn away from him. The next thing is this, by pouring out common grace. Common grace is a theological term that refers to the general blessings God gives to men regardless of their spiritual state. Jesus says this way, the sun shines on the just and on the unjust. It rains, the rain falls on the righteous, and it falls on the wicked. I mean, wouldn't it be a humorous thing if it only rained on the yards of believing families? And you could drive around South Florida and you knew who believers were because they had nice green grass. And you could tell who the unbelievers were because their grass had died. Or if it was cloudy over, over the unbelievers' homes, but man, the believers walked out and the sun was shining. No, 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 Jesus says he, he demonstrates his goodness to all whether they follow him or whether they don't follow him. That's why I just don't get people who, who turn their fist to God as if they don't need him. They don't realize that God, with the click of a finger even quicker than that, could send them out into a Christless eternity. And they're here today only because God allows them to be here. The goodness of God. God's good even to unbelievers by putting the desire for him in every human heart. Solomon said it this way in Ecclesiastes 3.11, God has put eternity inside every human heart. You see, there's something in man that drives him to seek ultimate meaning outside of himself. Now, many people try to find that in other things, but God has put that desire for him in our hearts. The French philosopher Pascal said he called it a God-sized vacuum that was placed in the heart of every single individual, a hole that only God can fill. God is good even to those who don't believe in him, but God is good to those who do believe in him. God is extremely good. How does he do it? I've mentioned five ways in your notes by giving us eternal life, the moment that we believe. You see, it doesn't matter if you've run away from God for years and years and years. If you've ignored him, if you've rebelled against him, if you've cursed him, it doesn't matter. The moment you turn to him in sincerity and repent of your sins and you believe by faith in him, how does God respond? He responds with grace. He responds with forgiveness. He responds by giving life. You see, God blesses us by giving us immediate access to him through prayer. And you and I, we can boldly enter into God's presence. The, the third thing is he, he's good to us by answering our prayers, but not all of our prayers. Listen, you might not realize it or not, but, but there's a reason why God doesn't answer all of your prayers and all of my prayers, because many times what I pray for is not what is best for me. And many times what you pray for is not best for you. And God is so good that he doesn't always give us what we want. He gives us what we need, the goodness of God. He's good to us by giving us everything we need to live for him. He's given us the indwelling Holy Spirit of God. He's given us the word of God. He's given us the body of Christ where we find encouragement and strength. And he's good to us by giving us purpose even in the tragedies of life. You see, even in the tragedies of life, what, what makes it different for the believer is we realize that God has an ultimate purpose in that. As I quoted Romans 8.28 just a few moments ago, we realize, those of us that believe, we realize that God takes everything and uses it for his 
good. Whatever you're going through in life, whatever tragedy that you're experiencing, realize that God, in His ultimate wisdom, in His ultimate grace, is going to use that for His good in your life. And you might not understand it now, but one day when you get to heaven, it will all make sense. Even the difficulties of our life, God uses for his good. You see, we need to realize that everyone receives God's goodness. Let me say one final thing, and I'm done today. The final thing is this. God's goodness is confirmed in Jesus Christ. The goodness of God is confirmed in Jesus Christ. I mean, we could, we could take hours and hours and hours and talk about that, and we're not going to. Paul says this in Colossians 1.15. He says, he, speaking of Jesus, he is the image, the express image, the identical image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. And so God, in his goodness, sent his son, who is innately perfect, innately good, to give his life for those of us who are not good. And God confirms his goodness through Jesus Christ. As the visible expression of God's goodness, Jesus came for the purpose of reuniting fallen man with the merciful, gracious, patient, loving, and good God. In the ultimate demonstration of goodness, Jesus became sin for us who knew no sin so that we might experience the righteousness of God in him. Today, we give thanks. Why? Because God is gracious. God is good. Not because we deserve it. We certainly don't deserve it. But God, in his mercy, and in his grace, doesn't give us what we do deserve, and he gives us what we could never, ever deserve. A life with him now, and a life with him forevermore.